Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, good morning, everyone. Oh, I like that response. My name is Philip Mack, and I'm the Director of Admissions here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work, and I'd like to welcome you this morning to our MSW information session. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the fact that you are here today speaks well for you. Making the decision to go to graduate school is going to be one of the important decisions that you make in your lifetime. I rank it up there with, hey, when you select a partner or mate, or picking that first house that you want to purchase. This is an extremely important decision. Selecting the right grad school to attend is about fit. What is the proper fit for you? I, as Director of Admissions, will not sell the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work to you. I want you to become educated consumers. I want you to actually go out and shop around. And if this is the program that you do decide to enroll in, I want to make sure that you feel that it is the best fit for you. I have a formula. I say that selecting a graduate school is as simple as A, B, C. And if you noticed, I've highlighted that letter C. There are six factors that you want to consider that will help you with this decision. I don't care if you're applying to med school, law school, business school, or a school of social work. All of these factors will relate to helping you with what decision is best for you and what graduate school ultimately you wish to enroll in. The six factors are credentials, curriculum, campus or community life, counseling, cost, career opportunities. The first C is credentials. And the most important factor that you want to consider under the heading of credentials is, is the program an accredited program? One of the things about today in terms of higher educational institutions, there are a lot of online programs. I am not knocking online education, but many of the online programs are not an accredited program. So this is the first thing that you want to investigate with any graduate school that you're applying to. Is it an accredited program? If not, I would suggest that you stop right there and go on to the next program that's of interest to you. The University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work has been accredited by the Council on Social Work Education ever since 1930, 1939. We were last accredited in 2012. Accreditation for schools of social work, it goes for eight years, so we're good to go to the year 2020 before we'll go through that process again. Another thing under the heading of credentials is rankings. Right now, approximately, there are close to 200 and 50 accredited graduate schools of social work in the United States. The University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work is ranked by US News and World Reports as the 10th best graduate school of social work in the country. So if you're accepted here, if you apply to and are accepted here, you are accepted to one of the best programs of social work in the United States. Curriculum. Most important thing that you want to determine under the heading of curriculum is, will the coursework and classes that that particular program offers enhance your professional development? Each of you here probably has different interests. You want to see how our school matches up. I would suggest that you peruse the website. The one thing about social work, remember this, it is what we call a practice profession. It's not only about coursework, it is also about field work. So you want to investigate to make sure that we have not only coursework that it's in areas of interest pertaining to each of you, but we have field work opportunities that are in the areas of, of in your areas of interest as well. Campus or community life, please investigate, visit, just as each of you are doing today. If you've been accepted to that particular program or that particular school, do visit that program. Always remember this, you're going to do better academically if you fit into that campus environment socially. They both go hand in hand. 
So once again, if that school has accepted you, I don't care how much scholarship that that particular program has awarded you. Go and visit the sea if you feel that you can survive there both socially as well as academically. <clears throat> counseling. When I'm talking about counseling, I'm really talking about student support services. For example, here at the School of Social Work, each of you will receive an academic advisor. As I mentioned before, social work is a practice profession, so you're going to have a field instructor as well as a faculty field advisor. The point that I'm making, if something arises, either in your academic setting or in your field setting, there's going to be a guardian angel, someone that you could speak with regarding that issue or concern that you're having to help you find solution to your concern. One of the most important items that students are really concerned with, cost. Is the program affordable to you? And when I'm talking about affordability, really what I'm talking about, students often come up to me and ask me first about scholarship. Scholarship is important. The bottom line question for each of you is, how much do I owe in the end? How much did I borrow as an undergraduate student? How much do I need to borrow as a graduate student? What is that sum total going to be? What do my monthly payments look like? Am I going to make these payments over 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years? This is something that you want to determine. I'm going to give you an example of something that happened less than a month ago. We awarded a student here an $8,000 scholarship. I'll never forget, the student calls me, tells me that she's been accepted to three other programs. She received $30,000 scholarship from the University of Chicago, $18,000 from the University of Pennsylvania, and $15,000 from the University of Michigan. She's an in-state student here, so the difference between our award and the cost of tuition was $13,000. She was trying to convince me that our scholarship offer to her was the worst of the three because it was of less dollar amount. But the actual difference in terms of what the tuition cost versus the scholarship, we were the best offer she received because we were 13. Chicago's tuition is 45. So if you receive 30 from them and you have a $45,000 tuition, that's a $15,000 variance. So, and she spent, I'm going to say, about 20 minutes to a half an hour trying to convince me that I needed to re renegotiate her scholarship. One thing, I do not renegotiate. That's carved in stone. And the last C is career opportunities. As I mentioned, there are approximately close to 245 to 250 graduate schools, accredited graduate schools of social work in the United States. Believe it or not, of those 250, only 24 schools of social work have career centers within their school of social work. And we are one of those 24. What I mean by that, for those of you who come into our program full time and you're looking for part time employment while you're going to school full time, we can assist you with that. But much more importantly, when you graduate, we can assist you with your resume, with your cover letter, with your job search. We will even film you upon your request and do mock interviews with you so that you can see yourself on film to assess what are your strengths, what are your limitations. When it comes time for you to interview for that first post-master's job, we not only want you to represent yourself well, we want you to represent the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work well. I'm going to stop right now, and now I'm going to introduce you to Professor Lynn Coghill. Professor Coghill is the director of our MSW program. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, this is a good group, Mr. Mack. So, first of all, I want to introduce you to our dean, Larry Davis. He's the dean of our school and the director of the Center on Race and Social Problems. Some of you have met him, however, sometimes he's upstairs working and he likes to pop in incognito and you wouldn't want to mistake our dean. <coughs> That's me. So my job this morning is to tell you a little bit about the wider 
um, environment that if you choose to come here for your MSW, you will be coming to um, a wonderful university. This university has so much going on. We're Research One University. There's a lot going on in Pittsburgh. Certainly, if you're a sports fan, this is a great place for you. If you're a fan of the culture, as I am, it's also a very culturally rich city to be in to, for that very minimal free time that you're gonna have as a graduate student. But you know, it's nice to get off campus and go downtown and take advantage of the many opportunities that are offered to you by the city and also by the university, the wider university. There are lectures going on, there are student groups, there are performances, oh my gosh, just about anything that you're interested in, you will find on campus here. And this building is the second largest educational building in the world. So as you know, our uh, school is ranked 10th in the country. We're a pretty old program, and we have the uh, oldest COSA program, community organization program in the country. We also have a very large child welfare for education and leadership program housed here as well. We're very proud of our school. So just so you think that we don't spend all of our time in literally this limestone tower, uh, we get out in the field and this is the faculty and a, a few students on our United Way Day of Caring, putting a community garden to bed for the winter. So we certainly get our hands and feet dirty. So the goal of the MSW program certainly is to prepare graduates for uh, professional practice. For some of you, that may mean licensure. Many of you, I hope we do, uh, appreciate that both macro students as well as direct practice students all uh, seek licensure whether in Pennsylvania or in your home state it adds legitimacy to our profession and to you as a practitioner so this is a little bit about our student body that um, we uh, admit about 230 plus or minus um, each year. We also have two campuses. We have regional uh, campuses outside the Pittsburgh area. We have part-time cohort programs at our regional campus in Johnstown and the regional campus in Bradford. The Johnstown program focuses specifically on the mental health curriculum for direct practice students. The Bradford program focuses specifically on the children, youth, and family curriculum for direct practice students. Those students do not have a choice, uh, and they do the, they're working professionals, and they do the program part-time. Pitt, Maine, you're gonna hear today about how many wonderful choices we have for you here. Well, let me bring your attention to the very last number on the page. So Mr. Mack talked to you a lot about choosing a graduate program that fits for you. So not only do you want to match up geographic area, curriculum, university, rankings, all of these things, but you also want to know that if you make a commitment to come here to this graduate program that we are equally as committed to you. So 96% of our graduates, our students coming in graduate. So you wanna look at retention rates. Um, this has been in the news over the, over the past several years because some of the proprietary educational programs have very low graduation rates so that you want to make sure that whatever you're spending on graduate school and yes it is a lot of money that it's money well spent and that you're highly likely to come out at the end with the degree that you hope for in the area that prepares you to practice that you wish so we have two concentrations in the master's program direct practice concentration with individuals, families, and small groups, 
and COSA, which stands for, oh, wait, we're going to talk about direct practice first. So uh, direct practice certificates, we have a number of certificates available to you in the direct practice concentration. You do not need to choose a certificate, okay? The certificates are a package of courses, suggested courses, and field placement that best prepares you to work in that area of specialization in social work. But you don't have to do a certificate. So one of the popular hybrids with our students are students that want to work in mental health, but maybe with kids and families, okay? So they can cut and paste curriculum from both programs and then have their concentration field placement, their second year field placement with kids and families in a mental health setting. So it's very easy through academic advising to individualize your master's program for your particular area of interest. Okay, then we have community organization and social action. This, they also have a certificate available, the Human Services Management Certificate. We have both concentration chairs here to tell you more specifically about, and there are their pictures, but here they are in, in real life. <laughs> we also have several joint degree programs. So there, as I mentioned, you're going to have so many opportunities here that sometimes it's hard to decide which one is the best for you. A dual degree program, if you're interested in combining two different degrees, you can only choose one. The curriculum has been negotiated between the two schools to fit together and save you time and tuition if you were to do two degrees separately, okay? So the curriculum is pretty tight. There's not much wiggle room, so you really have to follow the curriculum plan in place for each of these dual degrees, whether it's a Master's in Divinity, a Juris Doctor, uh, so these degrees, MID and MPIA, are in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, so there are two choices in within that school, and then Public Health. We also more recently have a new uh, dual certificate and degree program, so it's an MSW degree with a certificate in secondary teaching. This program requires that your undergraduate degree be in one of the, uh, I'm not going to say it right because I'm not in charge of that program, but one of the main, if you were to teach in high school, you know, they have math, social studies, science, you ha your undergraduate degree has to be in one of those um, subject areas. And then you will get a secondary teaching credential, a master's in social work, and a home and school visitor certificate, which is a social work certificate in the state. It's a great combination. We also have recently finished all of the approvals for the MSW Masters in Business Administration. So both of those programs will be taking students in the fall. As I mentioned previously, we have a very large and successful child welfare for education faculty housed here. They have another facility in Mechanicsburg. In order for you to come in as a child, a CWELL, Child Welfare Education for Leadership Master's student, you have to already be employed by children, youth, and families in the state of Pennsylvania. And then you will apply for the CWELL funding program through your employer. You'll be accepted. You'll have to apply just like everybody else to the master's program and then the state will fund your master's education. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for those that are already employed by children, youth, and families. This is the teaching faculty from the CWELL program. Cynthia Bradley King is in charge of our CWEB program, which is the equivalent in the bachelor's. We have new faculty this year. 
uh, Darren Whitfield, Toya Jones, and Leah just started in January, and we don't even have a picture of her yet, sadly. But uh, just so you know, we're always uh, bringing on new faculty with areas of expertise that round out the school's expertise. So this is a great opportunity during spring break for students to travel to Cuba. It's a short trip, about nine days, originally started by Dean Davis. Um, this year he was unable to go, but Dr. Copeland, our Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, who, you will, who will speak to you later, she is now um, in charge of the trip. So this is um, currently a wonderful opportunity. In addition to that, several of us, I'm one of the grantees, um, the bachelor's program actually received a State Department grant to develop uh, study abroad opportunities for bachelor students. So a number of us were given grants. Um, uh, certainly, as MSW program director, what I'm thinking is we'll get it started in the bachelor's program and then just oh, master's students can do this too, right? So um, I have a grant to go to Germany, and we have faculty members that will be going to Israel, China, Portugal, Scandinavia. I may be missing, but you get the idea, right? Oh, Ghana. We have two people going to Ghana. So these are opportunities that uh, we can look forward to in the future. The bachelor's program it has some interest to send students this next academic year in the spring, so we're hoping that that will be realized. There is a student in Germany, a master's student, who's interested in coming here to study with us in the fall. So I'm hoping to really solidify that relationship. We had a bachelor's student from Germany last fall here. Um, so I'm hoping to um, solidify that academic arrangement between our two universities. So if you choose to come to our MSW program, you too might have these opportunities that are currently being developed. Okay, that's the end of my part. So Dr. Rachel Fusco, the Chair of Direct Practice, will tell you more about that curriculum. Thank you. No All right. Good morning, it's nice to see you all here on this beautiful day. Um, how many of you are thinking about a concentration in direct practice? Okay, and how many of you are, that's one of the things you're still trying to figure out? Okay, um, well just so you know, um, all of our students do uh, have to choose a concentration. You don't have to know for sure when you're coming into the program if you're doing the uh, the, the full program um, as opposed to advanced standing. Uh, you really have your first semester to, to make that decision. Uh, sometimes we have students who come in as direct practice and change to COSA or come in as COSA and change to direct practice. Um, but uh, Professor Soska and I are going to give you an overview of both of those concentrations and a little bit about how they look in the curriculum. Um, the, the first important thing to know about really all MSW programs is that uh, they all have a foundation that everybody takes, regardless of your concentration. Um, so in social work, our, our foundation classes are uh, uh, foundations of general social work practice, uh, foundation of practice with diverse populations, human behavior in the social environment, social welfare, and foundation research, often a student favorite. I'm being sarcastic. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, not everybody loves research as much as I do, but many come to love it. You might be surprised. Um, and you're laughing, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and in the direct practice curriculum, there's a sequence then of required practice courses that you take. Uh, all students uh, who choose direct practice take a, a course we call Models of Intervention. And in this course, you're introduced to uh, really kind of three broad approaches to practice, cognitive behavioral uh, systems and psychodynamic. Uh, then you go on and you take an advanced <coughs> direct practice that corresponds with one of those three approaches. Um, you also have the opportunity to take two advanced elective courses. Um, 
In addition, uh, all students in direct practice take a second level human behavior class that uh, is, is tailored to your particular interests, whether that's children and families, whether it's mental health, health or aging. Um, second level policy courses, again, that correspond to those kind of broad areas of practice. And a second, excuse me, a second level research course. And um, as Professor Coghill mentioned, uh, we do have uh, direct practice certificates. Uh, those are in either children, youth, and families, mental health, home and school visitor, gerontology, or integrated health. But it's incredibly important to, to mention and to think about the fact that for, for you, depending on who you are and what you want to do, a certificate might not be the best thing. You know, don't feel like that's a better option just because it's there. Um, it, it's most important that you really tailor the, tailor the curriculum to what you want to do, to who you want to work with. Um, so, you know, for example, um, one of my interests is child mental health, and we occasionally have, ch have students who are interested in child mental health, and really, um, our mental health certificate is more focused on adult mental health and our children, youth, and families is not so focused on mental health. It's more uh, focused on child welfare involvement and those kinds of things. So for students who kind of fall in that category, it doesn't necessarily make sense for them to, to follow a certificate program. So that way they can take a couple of mental health courses, a couple of children and family courses, and in that way, you know, again, really tailor the program to, uh, to what they're most interested in. So just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, we also offer, I mean, I think a really wide range of electives, again, that hopefully, you know, fit everybody's interests. Uh, just some examples here. This certainly is not a comprehensive list. Um, we have a course on uh, psychopharmacology and social work practice. For those of you uh, who do want to work in mental health settings where you want to have a better understanding of some of the medications that are prescribed and what the impact of those are and side effects and those kinds of things. You know, incredibly valuable for social workers to have that knowledge uh, when they're working on, you know, the multidisciplinary teams that they're often on. Um, courses in certainly drug and alcohol services, direct practice with children and adolescents. Um, our grief and loss course uh, is, I think, one of our most popular courses. You might be looking at it on this beautiful sunny day and think, that is the last thing I want to think about. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly kind of comprehensive class that uh, doesn't just talk about death, although, of course, death is part of that, but all of the different kinds of losses that people can experience and how, you know, of course, that can greatly impact them across the lifespan. Um, courses on practice with the elderly, intimate partner violence, social work in education settings. I mean, the great thing about being a social worker, or I should say one of the great things about being a social worker, is that we're everywhere. We work everywhere. We work with everyone. Um, so, you know, again, we, we try to provide as many educational opportunities as we can for you to, you know, get some knowledge about the different settings and the different populations that you could potentially uh, work with when you're out in, in practice. Likewise, uh, we have an incredible range of, of field placements uh, for you to get involved in, and you'll certainly hear more uh, from our field office. But examples, you know, substance abuse services, certainly schools, hospitals, uh, early childhood intervention, developmental disabilities, our students are placed everywhere, um, and field is such an incredibly uh, rich and important part of your overall educational experience. So a couple of things that you know we feel like is important to mention, and this might seem a little crazy to some of you because you haven't even started, and we're already talking about what we would like you to do at the end of your program. Um, but in, in social work, uh, while taking a li getting a license isn't mandatory, it's certainly incredibly important. And getting your LSW, your license in social work, is a way that you can really demonstrate your commitment to the profession. And I think it certainly, I, I mean, I think there are certainly employers who do want to see that. Uh, and, and, and again, see that as an indication that you, you're a real professional. Um, and uh, it's also important if you're a direct practice student uh, and you work in direct practice to think about taking the licensed clinical social work exam. Um, you can take that exam after two years of uh, supervised uh, post MSW practice experience. And having that LCSW is, you know, it's really kind of the gold, stand, uh, gold standard for uh, social work practitioners. Um, 
it allows you to, I mean, there are many jobs that are really only open to LCSWs, uh, certainly if you want to be a therapist. Uh, if you want to be in private practice, having the LCSW allows you to be able to direct bill insurance uh, and things like that. So, you know, something we just want you to keep, keep in the back of your mind as you move toward your professional goals. And um, our students are, you know, very well prepared to take the LSW after they graduate from their master's program. And 88% uh, of our MSW grads uh, pass the LSW on the first try, right? And you gotta factor in there the fact that some people are probably not gonna study all that well, or you know, like with all standardized testing, you know, we're not always like showing up after we've had a good night's sleep and all that kind of good stuff, so. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Professor Soska, who's gonna talk to you about our other concentration, uh, community organization and social action. Thanks, Rachel. You don't know how amazingly difficult it is for us to like stand here and not move around. I, know, I, I, I could not time. believe Mr. Mack being able to stand behind a podium and talk to you. That was like, because he's usually out strutting his stuff and, 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 and talking in his big booming voice. So I'm here to talk to you about the community organization and uh, social action concentration here at the school. It's our macro practice. You know, as we all know in social work, there's a, a micro level, uh, which is largely in the direct practice side, the meso level, uh, and the macro level of, of practice work. And ours is working with these larger systems. Now I could tell you a lot about our program, uh, but I think it's really helpful for you sometimes to hear about those alums who have gone through our program are doing really good things and are successful in their work. So let me hope my technology works here today and uh, take it away. I was really drawn to the COSA um, track and to macro practice because I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, not just policy, but um, the systems that we work in within our own city and with our country and how we kind of fit into those pieces. And so I feel like in order to do social work effectively, it's really important to understand the bigger picture. As social workers, you know, we are driven to serve people, to help them pull their own selves up by their bootstraps and being able to connect them to resources is really critical. In addition to knowing who the policymakers are, how laws are set, you know, how people engage, you know, how to develop relationships with folks that let them know these are the things that our neighborhoods need is really, really critical. Macro practice is so important in the field of social work um, because there are so many um, different, you know, so many systems uh, that um, really affect our daily lives and affect the community. Every um, person is part of a community, is part of a system, um, engages systems, um, and so as advocates um, we are able to help one person be uh, helping many people. The COSA program really focuses on preparing uh, new professionals to practice in human service organizations in communities and in the social policy arena. So COSA is community development work, uh, human services, nonprofit management work, and of course working in social policy, social change work. You can really impact change on multiple levels and the School of Social provides you with the tools and the skills through the educators here, the faculty, the staff, the resources that they have to the, the larger community to do that. The fact that the School of Social Work still is one of the social work programs in the country that still has a COSA program speaks to its commitment to community-based social work. To be in COSA here means you're part of a small cohort. Uh, this is a group then that has a lot of opportunities. The internships in uh, Pittsburgh provide the real hands-on learning and portfolio building experience that gives you the opportunity to then land in a good job right after graduation. I really valued being able to be connected, whether it be through field placement or through class projects, where we actually got to go into nonprofits, um, work with their leaders, with their program staff, learn about the ins and outs of the agency. I've been able to take what I've learned in the classroom and transition it into the field directly and simultaneously, which I felt like was really important. So whatever I was learning in the field and I'm applying my coursework to, I could also work with my mentors that were in the program, uh, my professors that I've built relationships with to bounce ideas off of and to work with. By having the university directly in the city allows us to have an opportunity to work with community organizations, 
um, to really be plugged in with what's happening here and to get some hands-on experience on um, in really important changes that are happening constantly. The community as a whole is, is rich with opportunities for COSA students and there are alums like myself who are interested in taking students every year to provide those same experiences. We have so many amazing local nonprofits here uh, and really being a part of this program allowed me to um, have um, a hands-on experience working with those nonprofits. By seeing that connection that the university has with the city um, makes all of the difference for me and um, I think makes all of the difference for the students, especially those who are doing COSA work. I think the fact that Pitt is able to produce um, COSA graduates who then go on to contribute to the region is phenomenal. Our uh, alums really practice in a lot of different settings. I mean, they're leading uh, nonprofit organizations. They're faculty members in schools of social work. If you look around the Pittsburgh neighborhoods, at the communities that are growing stronger, that have major revitalization going on. You'll see our alumni have been the leaders in those organizations or are currently leading those. School of Social Work has an amazing alumni network. Just to be connected to people that had a similar experience, similar training and orientation, and an amazing broad worldview really helps go a long way with navigating and create incredible opportunities for employment that exists across the country. If you want to be in a, in a place where you know that people want to solve the issues that are burning in your soul and that you really want to be a part of something amazing, I think that COSA is, is a way to go. Having a degree from the School of Social Work COSA program is at the heart of being able to help people. We were taught um, in the COSA program to understand those connections and the networks that are here in the city. And it's literally every day where I'm just like, I chose the right field, I chose the right program, and this job is so perfect for me. So I want to thank our alums. It's always nice to hear from them. And uh, uh, I was just out looking uh, you know a few of our, our programs the other day on, on bus tours we've done this past week. Um, what we're really about is preparing new professional leadership. As we look at our uh, nonprofit human services uh, community organization work, you know, there's a lot of people who lead those organizations and they come from different professions but historically the legacy of social work has been one that we have been the leaders of those organizations. So if we're not turning out the leaders of community planning and development work, if we're not turning out the future leaders in community human services and leading those human service organizations, and if we're not out front and leading the efforts about social and community change and the national, local, and state levels, then we won't be looking at hiring other social workers. If we're not the leaders of our organizations, the premium isn't there for social work. So our school is committed to constantly reinfusing the new and emerging leadership into this sector uh, so that all social workers will be proud parts of that community. And I'm proud not only to be uh, an LSW, but also a member of our professional association, the National Association of Social Workers. And we do encourage our students in COSA to be part of that community as well. Um, so what will you do? Where will you work? We're, we're really concerned with larger macro systems. Uh, that's where we get the term macro practice here. But we're also good at working with small groups. Um, you know, many of you, how many of you have been uh, leaders in your student organizations? Good number of you. How many, you, you realize that Every organization that's out there is really sustained and continued by that small core group of leadership that keeps it going. It's constantly about renewing that leadership. As we talk in our work in community organizing, organizers organize organizations because it's the organizations that keep this work of social work alive. So we practice also in communities, community-based organizations, community development corporations. We work with organizations that are leading coalitions and collaboration efforts because social problems and social policies are complex. As our president just realized, health care is complex. So let's wait for taxes and see how complex that is. So the challenge for complexity means that we need to pull our resources together and work effectively, cooperatively, and create common visions to achieve this kind of work. We also need to do a much better job and working in the social policy arena. When I think 
that only 22% of the people we serve and work with vote. We have a critical issue in our country that we as social workers need to be out there addressing. So working in the policy, politics, and power is really important. And we like to train our social workers not to be afraid of working with power. As you notice from the slides, we have a number of leaders in the city council here. In fact, two chiefs of staff are now our uh, alums from our COSA program. They all have interns. Several other offices have MSW alums working as staffers in those offices, and they have student interns. Our goal in the next two years, under this new policy practice initiative of the Council on Social Work Education, is we'd like to have an intern in every single office, and hopefully social workers staffing every single office in our city government and hopefully later county government. So our presence is important in these kinds of arenas. So what are your study options? Well, for the most part, student, students in COSA study in two areas, either in social administration, which we now really refer to as human services management, or in community practice, which is organ community organizing, community planning, community development, and community change work. We do have a certificate in uh, human services management. That is in cooperation with the Network of Social Work <coughs> Management. That is a national organization that's created competencies that they feel are important for the next generation of leaders and the current leaders in that profession. So we're proud to be one of the 17 schools of social work that are partnered with the Network of Social Work Management uh, to give our students a certificate that's not just school recognized, but nationally recognized. And so you can complete that here at the school. We are currently working now on another one in community practice with the Association of Community Organization and Social Administration, an organization that I've been the national chair of. And uh, I'm also leading the effort for the certification. So I am certain we're going to be the first school to offer that certificate. Uh, we also, as noted, have a number of joint degrees, uh, not just uh, the Masters of, of International Affairs and Masters of International Development, but also the Masters of Public Administration, because many of you may want to do a joint degree and work in public administration, in government kinds of work and, and efforts. The public health program has been widely successful, and we're out there leading important efforts now in, in public health, uh, law, divinity, and now business, because many of you will not be working in nonprofit organizations when you come out. You'll be working in for-profit human service organizations. And we want to make sure that social workers are prepared to lead and manage in that environment as well. Uh, we have a UPMC health system here uh, that has a major insurance <coughs> program. That is now headed by a social worker who also has an MBA. So our curriculum, uh, basically, there's a, a core curriculum of second level foundation courses, and that's the human behavior in the urban environment. We are in a city. It's an urban environment. So we want to make sure you're prepared to understand poverty and other issues. However, Monday, I'll be taking a busload of students out to our suburban communities to look at suburban poverty because our first ring <coughs> suburbs have become a critical place of poverty issues now in our region, our county, and it's the same across the country. And so we want our students to understand that. We also have a course on social welfare, a second level course on organization and public policy. And there are also second level research options. Uh, all of our research classes are now open to all our MSW students. However, we do encourage program evaluation for our human service management students and community-based participatory research for our community uh, organizing students. Uh, we also have uh, two core skill classes, community organizing and social administration or human services management. And you're also required to take two COSA skill elective courses. You also have uh, general elective requirements, depending on whether you're advanced standing or, uh, and you can take those both in social work and in other schools across the campus. Uh, and you also have your COSA field work. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of some of the electives that are here under our community organizing and social administration. Uh, we are adding a new one, uh, as you see here, on social enterprise, social marketing, and social media, uh, because the, the enterprise side of our nonprofit sector is really important. The idea that we can actually generate programs. Uh, some of you got to see Everyday Cafe uh, on, on a bus tour yesterday. Uh, one of our faculty members actually established a third place, uh, an Everyday Cafe for people to gather and meet in the community. And that's a social enterprise. It actually generates revenue that goes back into programs. So we want you to be on the cutting edge of that work as well. Learning how to write grants and proposals. We talked about our school being engaged in the community. Our students have written millions of dollars in grants for organizations that have been funded out of their grants and proposal class. 
We want you to learn not only in the class, but in those classes to be able to apply them to the field. Um, we have other classes that uh, are available to you in the other schools, uh, Graduate School of Public International Affairs, Public Health. Uh, it's not essential for us to create a course in geographic informational systems. We have two excellent courses on this campus. One of the advantages to coming to a university like ours is that we are a university. We have all these other disciplines and schools with all this expertise and knowledge for you to learn from. So please, while you're here, take advantage of it. Students here can also take up to two courses in other universities in Pittsburgh. So we invite you to take a look at what's being offered. It's the same thing in social administration. We have now combined our human resources and financial management supervision in a class. And there are a number of other courses that we have uh, uh, related to uh, human services management. And there are other courses across the university system that relate to this area as well. Um, nope. So lastly, I just want to remind you that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. This quote's attributed to uh, Margaret Mead. At least I like to think she said this. Uh, so I will be around uh, for the information uh, Q&A. Uh, how many of you are COSA? A few of you? Okay, I'll be available to answer questions after that Q&A session, too. Thank you very much. And next up, uh, is Valerie here yet? No. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, John talk. Let me get you up here. Yeah. There you go. Hello, everyone. A good morning. I know you're getting a lot of information here today, so I want to tell you a little bit about our uh, field education office. And <clears throat> I want you to try to remember three items individualization do you want to come up and go now okay I'll get back to you shortly <laughs> yeah. everybody thank you I'm sorry I was outside I thought they were gonna call me but you know women would call each other you know come on sister come on <laughs> guys they think that we just know all this stuff so unfortunately I don't know all this stuff that's going on but anyway I'm Valerie Carr Copeland I am the uh, associate dean for academic affairs for the school and um, I'm going to talk to you about three um, different things this morning, and hopefully I'm going to try to um, get through this very quickly. And if you have any questions, I've left my card on the outside table. So I want to talk to you about the joint degree program that we have between the School of Public Health and the Graduate School of Public, uh, Graduate School of Public Health and the School of Social Work. Um, <coughs> It is a degree program that takes about three years for students who are interested in social work, but also are interested in uh, working in public health services. One of the reasons um, we developed this program probably about 12 to 15 years ago was we found that a lot of our MSW graduates were working in public health service, uh, whether that was um, local public health departments, or local community health services, or working at the state level. But they were not getting paid the same salary that graduates would get paid with a uh, MPH, even though they were doing the same work. And so we decided that in order to have um, MSWs be competitive with MPHs and also be able to get the same salary that we would do a joint degree program. We had already had a joint degree program at the uh, PhD level, but we decided to do a joint degree program at the uh, MSW level. So the skills are very similar. I think one of the things that students that do the straight uh, public health degree without the MSW, um, feel like the disadvantage is that they don't get the people skills. 
they get the health promotion skills, they get the skills for developing health promotion programs and community health planning, but they don't get the uh, communication skills. On the social work side, uh, students get a lot of direct practice skills but they don't get the skills to work with populations. And public health is all about population programs. Instead of looking directly uh, or doing one-to-one, -one, you're looking at community um, neighborhoods, you're looking at community systems, you're looking at state systems, regional, but you're thinking about services that will benefit large groups of people at one time. At, instead of just doing the one-on-one. -on -one. So if you do the joint degree program, you come out with both skill sets. There is flexibility, um, and as I said, you, in you increase the value of your salary. You get a higher salary, too. Um, both programs are highly ranked, as I said to people last night. I, I like to say this, and I'll say this up front. You know, we are a number 10 school, and if you decide to go someplace else that is not one through nine, I think you're making a mistake. You don't want to go to a school that's lower ranked. You want to go to a school that best fits your needs. If you go to a school that is not ranked as high, you want to make sure that that school has the specialty that you're looking for. For us, we have a specialty of healthcare. We've been doing uh, community health and uh, public health work probably for the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, I am a product of the school. I received my MSW here. I went away and practiced for about six and a half years. I came back and I received my PhD. And while I was getting my PhD, I also got the uh, MPH. So, I've been around for a long time. I know these programs, and I know what's going on around the country. So there are very few programs that compete with us, that can compete with us uh, with regards to the health curriculum that we provide for MSWs. In fact, at the federal level, when people are talking about what schools of social work have the <coughs> best healthcare concentration over and over and over and over again, the feds are told to contact the University of Pittsburgh. So for us, that feels really good. Um, you know, you can consider why you want to do the MPH, why you want to do the MSW. I think if you look at what's going on politically, there, we don't know what's going to happen uh, with regards to some of the basic um, programs that are in the Affordable Care Act, uh, but what we do know based on the Affordable Care Act that the jobs that will come available in the next 10 to 15 years that relate to social work will be in health care. Uh, Mr. Simmons will tell you about that later. He has the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The reason those jobs will be slightly higher is because it's going to depend on the new jobs that are going to come away in health that will be developed in health care. And those social workers who are in the health care field now will be retiring. So therefore, you have the opportunity for a double hit. If you're committed to serving vulnerable populations, the same thing that you would get in social work, you would get that uh, in public health. I think that when students go out and they are dual focus. It opens up different kinds of doors for them. The MSW itself opens up a bazillion doors. You know, you never will go wrong with just having an MSW. But because the world is going in the way that it's going, it's really important for you to think about whether you want to be dually trained. And so that MSW, along with another degree, can open up a bazillion and 500 doors for you. So not only do we have the MSW and the MPH, but I think somebody probably told you we just developed the MSW and the uh, MBA <coughs> program. I'm sure uh, Professor Zaska talked to you about the MSW and the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. 
And we also have the MSW with the secondary teaching uh, certificate in education. I think the world is realizing that there are a lot of social determinants of health and health care and a lot of social determinants that impact the quality of the lives of the people that we serve. And so we can't just break people in half, but social work gives us a holistic approach and with another degree, it gives you an additional uh, paradigm to look at. For people who are in uh, MSW, MPH programs, where are they? They're per, they are patient service managers, they're research uh, specialists, they work in um, program development, program evaluation, uh, they are working at the federal level at the Department of Health and Human Services, they're working in um, state uh, health departments as well as uh, state government. Some of them are teaching part-time uh, for us and in other schools of social work around the world. We see these, um, we see the program that we currently have as more leadership development, although uh, you can do the MSW and the MPH and make sure that you are just focusing on, um, on um, the basic level of the work that you do, or if you want to do leadership, we try to develop field practicums <coughs> where you work with uh, mid to upper level management people. I think to two, the two together bridges a certain gap. And for me, it bridges a gap that says when you are working with children, youth, family, and women, that their social environment impacts what's going on in their lives. And I think the, um, the dual degree perspective continues to um, validate the need that we can't just look at one aspect of a person's life. I was saying to someone last night that um, when you think about uh, working in serious mental illness, somebody with a serious mental illness, it doesn't mean that these people are not gonna have chronic heart disease. It doesn't mean that they're not gonna um, develop uh, cancer. It doesn't mean that they're not gonna develop any of the uh, medical diagnosis that we see. And you see people with um, come into primary care that have been diagnosed with cancer, chronic uh, heart disease or diabetes or uh, whatever, mesothelioma. One of my uh, uh, personal friends just passed away the other day with mesothelioma. There's a psychological response to that. And so the interaction between one's physical health status and one's mental health status is very important. And that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons we try to make sure that our students are duly trained to work in either or area that uh, combines both of those specialties. The um, Evans uh, Fellowship is a fellowship that so many of you have heard about and it was uh, developed uh, on behalf of one of the heroines from social work who worked in the public health service, Juanita Evans. And Juanita felt that a lot of the work that social workers were trained to do naturally, that they could do in a public health service um, environment. And as a way to show our appreciation to what um, Juanita uh, advocated for, we, dena we named our Evans uh, Fellowship after uh, Juanita. And it is a, fe a fellowship that focuses on uh, leadership development. For students who are in um, COSA and would like to go the dual degree track, uh, they <laughs> can apply, or many of you have applied, because I think we're very, uh, I think we may have one or two slots for, uh, for the Evans Fellowship. It provides a $10,000 scholarship for your concentration placement. So if you're in COSA, you only have to do your foundation placement and your concentration placement. If you are a DP and you apply for um, the Evans and, um, I'm trying to keep track of my time, and if you are selected, 
not only do you do your foundation placement and your concentration placement, but you do a third placement because we want to make sure that you have those basic direct practice skills in your area of concentration. <laughs> and then on top of that, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to develop some leadership skills to work in direct practice environments. And so you are asked or required to do a third placement and we ask that that be done in the summertime. So instead of going out and looking for a job in the summertime, you have the opportunity to um, do your field placement and you also receive uh, a $10,000 scholarship for that. Um, the Evans Fellowship Program is coordinated uh, by both of the schools. Uh, Dr. Mark Friedman, who is in the Graduate School of Public Health, is the lead person on that for the School of Public Health, and I'm the lead person on that for here in the School of Social Work. As I said, uh, that was a program that was three years long. We were expecting a fourth uh, year funding. We have not heard about the fourth year funding. We are very skeptical that we're going to get the fourth year funding given the way in which the recent political, uh, the political environment. We just don't think that there's going to be a lot of money in the federal government for workforce training programs. <laughs> now I'll talk to you about the Audemars Cannon Fellowship. Um, Ida Cannon was one of the first social workers in healthcare. Um, she worked at um, she worked at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and she was asked to do a lot of training of uh, medical residents because at that time they realized that a lot of the problems that they were seeing in women and maternal and child health were not just medical problems, but they were problems related to the kinds of environment that they were living in. So Ida Mark Cannon was one of the first uh, social workers in healthcare, and that's why uh, we named this particular fellowship after her. Um, I'm going to just kind of skip through this and tell you what the requirements are. The requirements for the Ida Mark Cannon Fellowship is at least a 3.A of 3.5, of a GPA of 3.5. You have to be a second year um, MSW student, or you have to be in advanced standing. You have to have a strong commitment to a career in integrated health care because you have to obtain uh, an integrated health care certificate. Uh, and you have to attend the monthly uh, seminars. Now, think in, think in terms of what do you get with this $10,000. So a lot of students think that $10,000 is a lot of extra work. If they tell you, well, I don't know because it's a lot of extra work, I'll tell you what the extra work is for the $10,000. You have to do one monthly seminar that lasts for an hour and 30 minutes. So there's a 90 minute requirement once a month <coughs> that you attend a seminar where we bring in um, two healthcare professionals to model the way in which social workers work with other healthcare professionals in the field. And so some students feel like a long day of uh, being in a placement and then having to come in and doing an hour and a half placement, that that's a lot of work. I don't think that that's a lot of work because I think once you get out in the real world, you're going to realize that an hour and a half when somebody tells you you need to stay at work extra for an hour and a half, I don't think you're going to tell them that you're tired and it's, you know, and it's not in your job description. So that's the one thing that we require for uh, the canon, and we do that because it is a um, it is a federal program. I will entertain a few questions because Phil has given me the nod that my time is over. I will take any questions related to the canon or the Evans Fellowship, and if you have other questions. Um, my card is out at the table, and you can email me or give me a call. Question. I'm sorry. Can you help me understand what it is when you're reading healthcare? It's all about. So we place students in primary healthcare setting, and they work on an interdisciplinary team with. Uh, doctors and nurses and PT people and specialists 
And this particular integrated healthcare piece focuses on um, adolescents from 13 to 21. And so what you're seeing in the field is that you're seeing people who work together that looks at the way in which behavioral health and physical health come together and manifest itself in individuals. And then you see the team working on how you're going to do that. Otherwise, sometimes you just focus on the primary health care piece or you focus on the mental health piece. And what the training now is to say, let's see how this works together and how can we prepare you to work in organizations where this is done. And within that part, is, is, it, is that facility kicked out or is there an opportunity to be able to say, I want to work in No, no, no. Okay. We, we uh, have to approve the placements okay. because we have to approve the supervisors who are going to be training you. Other questions? Okay. Look forward to seeing you guys. Hail the pit. Thanks, Ralph. I think John's next. As I said earlier, I'll be back. <laughs> now, here I am. Okay, I want you to remember three items, and I'm going to give you two little pieces of homework to do. I know you're going to love this, but it's very, very, very simple. I know you're getting a lot of information about the classes, and now I'm going to tell you about the uh, field office process, but I want you to think about three things. Individualization specialization and organization so no matter where you're going you need to find out is it an individualized of the process when you need to find your internship some schools just say we have these agencies and you're gonna go here you're gonna go there you're gonna go there we have a very individualized well thought out uh, where we find out what are your interests and then we try uh, to match you to those agencies because we have found that if you're very interested in your internship and it's something that you really want to learn there's not going to be a lot of issues or problems after you're at that internship site if you feel like it was your last option and you kind of had to take that internship sometimes it becomes an issue but what I have to ask you is that uh, before you start the field process is to really think what kind of work do I want to do because that makes it easier for us to try to help you find those options one of the things about uh, the field is though as you heard social work is a very large field you have a lot of different options so it's not always that easy to say this is where I would like to work. You've got a community organization, you've got health care, you've got mental health, you've got aging, you've got children, youth, and families. So there's a lot of options. So in some ways, the internship allows you to explore maybe some options that you're not 100% absolutely sure of. So we have uh, five people in our office myself and then four others and why I want to talk about specialization is that we just don't give all applications to everyone in our office say you want to do the home and school of the visitor program Deborah Robinson is the expert on that integrated health Melvin Cherry a community organizing Cecily Davis. Aging in uh, the gerontology program is Amy. So other schools and these are things that, that you're going to want to find out. Am I going to work with the same person from the day I enter the program until the day I leave the program? Sometimes you're talking to one person in the fall term and then another person in the spring term and then somebody else next fall we try to have you with one anchor person from the time you get in that person starts to get to know you they know what your interests are they know what type of agencies are out there so 
that's why I say the more work that you do prior to coming to tell us your interest, the much easier it will be for us then uh, to line you up with the right organizations. We probably have contracts with close to 600 agencies. So one thing to think about though, that tells you how much you can do in the social work field. We couldn't have 600 agencies if it was a very limited field. Um, so as I was saying, we're also very organized, at least I would like to think so. I have found that the more proactive that we are and the more we find out about you up front, by the time you start the field placement, you're pretty satisfied as to where you will be. And the agency has an opportunity to interview you. And so we really want it to be a good match from the very beginning. And also, keep this in mind, it's a 60, um, it's a 60 credit program and 18 of those credits are your field work. So we often tell people that this is not only an internship, it is an extended interview because a lot of our students do get hired at the end of these internships because someone's been working there for six months. They get to know you. They get to know what kind of work habits you have. So always keep that in mind that it's an opportunity to learn, but it's also an opportunity uh, to network. And um, Mr. Simmons will be able to tell you about all of the wonderful jobs that are out there afterwards. So the one other thing, and these are, and this is probably true of all of the MSW programs, you're never on your own. You have a faculty person that's going to help you at the register for the coursework. You have a field person in our office that's going to help you find that internship. You have a field supervisor at the agency that oversees your hours. And you have a field liaison from the school that will come out once in the term to say, how's everything going? So if you ever have a problem and there's an issue, there's about four or five people that you can readily ask. So I like to say in our office, the only problems we can't solve are the ones that we never hear about because those are a little hard to solve if you don't actually have all the information. So we have a very solid process in place. We meet with each of the students. Again, we just don't say, okay, you're going to go here or you're going to go there. There is an application process, but that process is basically just the opening piece. That is to say, <laughs> what areas am I interested in? Then we'll actually sit down with you and find out okay why are you interested in these areas are you going to have an automobile uh, what area are you living in what is your long term at the end of this msw program where do you want to end up so uh, the more you know where you want to go the more we can help you reach that okay and so we will set up agencies interviews and our field uh, field learning plans are basically outlined that they can work in any agency. So even though we've got 600 agencies, some are working with kids, some are working with aging, some are working, all of those have opportunities where you can learn to engage, assess, intervene, and evaluate. So it doesn't matter what really agency you're in, you'll have the same learning opportunities. It, it might not be exactly the same, but you're going to have those opportunities. Over 400, oh, I, I need to update that. That's over 600 and it keeps on climbing. And uh, we have them probably within a hundred miles of the school and even farther sometimes. And these are the two pieces of homework that I'm going to give you. And why I am going to give you this information is because if there's an agency that you don't see in this information, that doesn't mean that 
it cannot be an agency. So say you've heard of an organization and when I give you the information on how to find what agencies that we have and you don't see it on there, you could contact us and say, I've heard about ABC agency and I think I might want to intern there. Now, we don't want you calling them, but call us and say, can you find out if it's an option? So we're always looking to add organizations. So just because you don't see it on the list, that does not mean it can't happen. And we, and we run the agencies from infancy to older adults and any social problem you could possibly think of. So I often say that social work is one of the f only fields that you basically have endless options because it pretty much is, is endless. Um, okay, this is your homework. It's very simple. When you have time, go on to www.fieldedlink.pit.edu and that will give you a list of all of our current agencies. And they're under different, like there'll be um, aging, you look under that, children, youth, and families, you'll look under that. So that'll give you an idea of all of those various options that are out there. And the other thing that I think you should look at, and this kind of overlaps into our next speaker, and this is very simple to remember, www.socialworkers.org. That's the NASW national site, and you can go on there, and they have what's called a job link, and they'll show you the jobs all across the United States. You'll see thousands and thousands of different types of jobs. So it really tells you how much you can do in this field. So that's a small piece of homework to do, because I know you're getting a lot of info right now. But if you're looking at any other schools, the items that you want to kind of uh, compare apples to apples are, how individualized is the process? Do they send you to agencies or how much input will I actually have? How specialized is it? Will I be working with the same people from the beginning all the way through the end or will I kind of be shuffled around? And how organized is it? Are they going to work with me from start to finish? And as I need help, we got a process in place, and you have a lot of people there that w will be there to help you. So that's the general overview on field, and I know we'll have an opportunity to answer questions at the end. So I will turn it over to our job expert, Professor Bobby Simmons. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Simmons. I am the director of the Career Services in the uh, Vancouver Career Center. You may have already heard that we are one of, uh, I think, 24 schools of social work that uh, uh, have their own in-house uh, career service program. We're very proud of that. Our program mm -hmm. is uh, titled, the uh, name of our uh, career center is the Vancouver Career Center. We had the uh, official open house so uh, October 2015. Um, and uh, I can tell you now that it has been very, very busy, and that's what we're all about. One of the philosophies that we have here, particularly regarding career services, is that we know, I know, we all know that you're going to get knowledge, skills, and values when you come here. You're going to get the skills and the knowledge, the things that you need to do in order to go out and do the good work that social workers are called to do. But the other piece of that that, that I, I strongly encourage everyone to think about is the career development piece. It's very, very important. They go hand in hand. It's like parallel tracks. And you, you're going to get the knowledge, skills, and value, but we also want to make sure that you are prepared, prepared to go out and get the job of your choice. And, 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 and we put together a variety of programs to make sure that you are prepared to do these things. I mean, some are very basic, but they are very important. You know, in terms of our workshops that we have, uh, resume writing, cover letters, effective interviewing, uh, salary negotiations. Believe it or not, social workers, we don't do a good job of salary negotiation. So I will, when you leave my program, you're going to do a good job with uh, uh, salary negotiation. You've heard a lot about licensure. We have 
multiple resources, multiple resources in the Vancouver Career Center to make sure that you are prepared to take the license exam and pass that license exam. The last five years, the national average for all the um, uh, universities, that, all the social, school of social work in the United States, the national average in passing first time rate is 82 percent. That's the national average for the last five years. Here at the School of Social Work, Pitt School of Social Work, the national average, I mean our average is 89 percent and 87 percent for the last five, over the last five years. So you will definitely, definitely uh, pass this exam. If you come up to the Vancouver Career Center, I have a sign that says you will get licensed. <laughs> so you're going to know what you're going to do when you get there. So we provide these workshops every term. Every term we repeat the same workshops, we add new workshops every now and then. Uh, so you definitely, definitely will have the opportunity to make sure that you are prepared to uh, uh, do the things that you need to do in order to get the job of your choice. Individually, we also provide individual consultations. And again, we cover uh, <clears throat> self-assessment. We talk about your career plans. Uh, I, I critique and review uh, cover letters and resumes all the time, which is something I really enjoy doing. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about evaluation job offers on, on the individual basis. We will give you mock interviews, where we will vid video you and critique you immediately after the uh, mock interview sessions. We'll also talk about networking in terms of, you know, where you're going to go, where you hope to, to live. If you're not going to stay here in Pittsburgh, if you're going to go to another city, uh, some other uh, area uh, within the country, we talk about networking strategies. We also do networking here within our own school. This past Thursday, we had our March Career Madness networking event, where we had multiple alums who came here in this room, as a matter of fact, and uh, shared their information with, uh, with, with our students. Next Thursday, next Thursday, we will have our fourth annual job fair, spring job fair. We will have 16 agencies here in this room ready to hire our students. So we work very hard for you. We work very hard to make sure that not only that you're pre prepared, but to make sure that we make the connections with the community so we can uh, put you in front of our, uh, our, our agencies that certainly would like to hire you, okay? This is a, just a snapshot of our small but mighty career center. It's the Van Kirk Career Center. Uh, it's upstairs on the 22nd, uh, 22nd floor. Uh, we have uh, sample resumes, cover letters, uh, many licensure uh, manuals and other resources. We have two computer stations where you can take practice licensure exams uh, within, the, um, within our career center. And you can see my little sign that just says you will get licensed. Uh, <clears throat> so it's important that you think about your career development. The jobs are there. I'm confident that the jobs are there. Uh, social work is projected to grow by 12% through the year 2024. That's compared to all other professions. All other professions are, are projected, projected to grow by 9%. Social work is projected to grow by 12%. Healthcare within social work is lead, will lead the way. Uh, but all aspects of social work are growing uh, but not, not at the same level, obviously, but, so, but health care certainly is, is, is the fastest growing aspect of, of social work. One of our motto, is, uh, motto for the Career Center is that it's your career, you know, make it happen. And, and, and again, I cannot express how important it is that you, that you think parallel. You're going to get the knowledge and skills, but also I want to be prepared when I go before that agency, when I go before that interview, get that interview, make sure that I'm the person that they, make sure that you're the person that they choose. And if you do that, you take a very active role from day one, from the di very first day that you come in our program, networking starts the very first day. And it will continue throughout your opportunities here. And uh, as you meet your colleagues, professors, um, <coughs> agencies, and if you do all those things, take it very seriously, take ownership of your career development, you'll get to hear my two favorite words. Anybody want to guess what they are? You're hired. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. And um, one, last, one last thing. I will not be around for the, um, 
uh, uh, for the Q&A. But my, um, my email is very simple. It's bobby at pitt.edu. And if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to uh, uh, email me. I will be more than happy to answer any questions. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Melissa Brzozowski. I'm the coordinator for the Hartford program. Um, it's actually a Hartford Partnership Program for Aging Education, um, but we like to call it HPPAE or HAPPY. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about our program. Um, it's a national program developed by the John A. Hartford Foundation, so there are about 70 of them across the country. Um, and what this means for you is that even if you're not staying here in Pittsburgh, um, if you go to other places around the country, likely they will have heard of Hartford because it is a national program. There are a lot of them throughout the country, so it's kind of a good, you know, networking, you know, conversation starter. People will have heard of this. They will know that it is a program in Jaren in gerontology. Um, it also was recently, a couple years ago, taken under the umbrella of CSWE, which is the accrediting body for social work programs. So it does have that extra level of prestige as well that it is under that umbrella. Um, so a couple of things um, about Hartford. Um, it's, there are several, basically, parts to our program. Um, the first one is that we, it's a program that's designed to teach you geriatric competencies. So we want you to leave here being experts in working with older adults. So we want you to basically know as much as you can about working with anywhere from what we like to call the welderly or the people that are, you know, they're healthy, they're active, they're out, we're out in their community, they're, maybe they're volunteering, uh, maybe some of them are still even working all the way to sort of the other end of the spectrum, so things like palliative care, um, hospice, end of life issues. We want you to have a broad range of experience working with older adults. Um, and so how that looks um, is that we have you attend a monthly seminar, um, and you will come and you will learn about things that you won't necessarily learn about in class. And we're always open to ideas if there are things that you want to learn, but some recent topics that we've had this year, we had one about sex in the older adult, so older adults are still having sex, um, and it's important to be able to talk to them about that and to understand the issues that might come up around that when you're working with older adults. We had a, t a speaker come in and talk about spirituality and working with older adults. Um, we also had a really great speaker come in from the Pittsburgh Foundation and talk about networking and negotiating and interviewing and some of those things that are going to help you professionally that maybe aren't exactly older adult related but that are going to help you get a job. So we really try and cover a lot of different topics. Most of them are older adult related but some of them are just sort of professional development leadership related as well. Um, rotational based field placements. Um, if you come into the School of Social Work and you just do sort of the regular program, you will be placed somewhere um, and you'll stay there the whole year for your field placement. If you come into Hartford, what we want you to do is to get, like I said, the broadest range of experience working with older adults. So you may stay in the same location but rotate throughout. So for example, if you went to the VA, they have so many programs there that you could rotate within the VA and get a lot of different experiences working with older adults. Um, there are other field placements where you may be placed somewhere in the fall and somewhere and go somewhere else in the spring. Um, so it does require a little bit of flexibility, um, a little bit of thinking on your feet, learning something new, but also you get lots of different experiences that way and we want you to have that. And where, what you end up with sort of depends on your interest in working with the field office, but we do have those placements. Um, enhanced role of the field instructor. So all of our field instructors are specifically Hartford field instructors and all of our field placements are partnerships that we've created to be Hartford partnerships. So they're really aware of what you're looking for in terms of learning about working with older adults. A lot of our field instructors actually were Hartfords. This is our 10th or 11th year as a program. So a lot of people that graduated from this program are now mentoring our students. So which is great about that because they really know what kind of experiences you're looking for. They know to look out for the best opportunities for working with older adults. Um, and then leadership development. So this is the one that everyone fears and loves at the same time. And this is the group project. Um, and this project is basically what will happen is you'll be put in a cohort 
um, and that you'll stay in throughout your time in our program. And usually that's if you come in as a first year master's student and you're here for the two year program, you'll be put with a group of two or three, maybe up to four other students who are in a similar position and you'll work on a project with them. And this is not your typical sort of research project, academic project. We really encourage you to be creative. We call it a leadership project or a community project. We want it to be something where you'll go out into the community, you'll make an, a difference, you'll make an impact, and, and it's something that people can continue after you've left. So some projects that we've had this year or recent years, um, we had somebody, we had a group that just had a lot of creative people that maybe had art or photography as their undergrad degree and so they really wanted to do something creative so they did an art exhibit on hoarding um, and they did it over in Posvar and one of the Posvar Hall which is just over here somewhere um, on one of these weekends where there were a lot of people coming through for you know info sessions so they had over a thousand people come through their art exhibit they had different artists in the area create art, photography, different kinds of things about hoarding. There was a lot of information about hoarding that people could take with them. They did questionnaires, they did education around the topic. So it doesn't have to be something, um, you know, just sort of researchy. We had a group this year that did, in a um, nursing home, they put together a prom. So they kind of identified that, that a lot of the people in this nursing home um, or sort of isolated, they're a little bit lonely, they don't always you know, get out and do stuff, they don't really have an opportunity to dress up and go out and have fun, and so they, may, they put together a prom in the activities room, and it was a huge success. They had like 50 people come, they had family members come in as their date, which gave them an opportunity to connect with family that maybe they don't see very much. They got them all dressed up, they had decorations and photo booths, and it was really great, and it's something that that nursing home is going to continue to do every year. So those are some ideas of really fun things that you can do. It doesn't have to be boring or academic, like I said. Um, and then the last thing here, oh, so everybody um, who does Hartford will get the gerontology certificate, so you'll take those classes towards that certificate. Um, and then the thing everyone loves to talk about or hear about is the potential for stipends. Um, so we like, like I said, our, all of our field placements are organizations and agencies that we've particularly partnered with and identified as Hartford field placements. And so most of them will offer stipends to our students and we've worked really hard to make that happen because you all are working really hard to do all of these other things that are outside of your normal degree. So we want to reward you, even if, if that's just a small amount of money per month to help you pay for parking or lunch or whatever it is that you need. Um, I, I always say this is not a guarantee and you don't want to come in to Hartford thinking I'm doing this for the stipend. Um, we've been able to offer about 90% of our students or 90% of our field placements have had stipends since I've been here, which is about three or four years. So, um, but it's, like I said, it's not always a guarantee. It really depends on your interests, where you end up, what you want to do. If there's an amazing field placement, but it doesn't have a stipend, you know, you probably still want to consider that. But for the most part, we do offer stipends. Okay, so here's my pitch for why, you, why should you do this. Um, you know, most people are, f are familiar with the statistics about baby boomers. These numbers might not even be correct anymore. They might be higher, but um, one in eight individuals is over the age of 65, and by 2030, one in five will be over the age of 65. Um, but what you might not know um, is that 12% of social workers say they want to work with older adults when they leave their programs. But in the first five years, about 75% of social workers will actually end up working with older adults. Um, and that's because, you know, the, the world is changing. Even if you're working with children in a school, you're going to be working with grandparents that are raising their kids. If you're working in a hospital, you're definitely going to be working with older adults. But even if you end up in children's hospital in the NICU, you're going to have older adults that are going to be raising their grandkids. Um, you're going to have, you're going to be interacting with older adults. And so it's really, this is a really good opportunity for you to get the best education around working with older adults. Um, it's a really good opportunity for you if you have any interest or you think you have any interest in working with older adults to have something really interesting on your resume that makes you stand out, that makes you really an expert in this topic um, so that when you're interviewing, when you're going out there, you, you know, you can show that you have this kind of education. So how do you apply? I'm not sure if I have, oh I do, okay. Um, so the application can be found here. 
But I always tell people it's really a lot easier. Just Google Pitt Hartford and our page will come right up. So you don't have to sit and write all this down. We do accept both COSA um, and advanced standing students as well as the regular direct practice students. Um, this is my email address if you have any questions. We're currently taking applications now for next, starting next fall. We usually take applications through the end of April and we hold sort of early May and we hold our interviews um, the second or third week in May. If you're not here in Pittsburgh, we can always Skype you in, so that's not a problem. We usually do about half our interviews over Skype, so that's fine. Just get your application to me. I would say in the next month or month and a half and you should be fine. Um, we do take applications after that on a rolling basis, just depending on what slots we have open, but it's really best if you can get it in and get in for those interviews. Um, and like I said, deadline apply by April. So I'll be here at the break if anybody wants to talk more or has any questions. Thank you.
the Pitt NSW program has so many wonderful alumni who are willing to help you get your foot in the door. And I think that's definitely a benefit of the program, much more than just getting that education. Um, so as a first year, non-advanced standing student, um, I chose <coughs> foundation classes in the fall because like I said, I have a psychology background and not a social work background. And I think if there's anyone in the room who has a psychology background, the difference I find is that psychology is much more science like focused and like looking at how you know the neurons in your brain fire and how you know all that behavior focus um, experimentation and everything happens. Where social work focuses much more on the person and their environment and how you know those systems play out in their lives and how we can help to affect them and make them better people and help change their lives. Uh, so in the fall, I took a generals class just about what social work is, a diversity class to help understand different populations that I might encounter in my career. You take uh, first level behavior and a policy class to understand how uh, social workers can, one, affect policy and help to advocate for people. And then just to understand, you know, things like the Social Security Act and understanding how much of an influence that has on social work. Um, so I'm integrated healthcare, so I'm focusing my education now on uh, what it will be like to work in a hospital and be a medical social worker. Um, so I'm in a second level behavior class on mental health and health, which focuses much more on um, the types of behavior that I'll encounter in my career as a medical social worker. Uh, I'm in models of intervention because I'm direct practice, so understand the different therapy <coughs> models that you can employ. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't have a policy class this semester because the integrated healthcare class isn't until the fall. So I'm taking social work and economics as an elective, which is great. And when I went into it, I thought economics is going to be kind of a dry topic. But I think the really interesting thing about social work and economics is that we're looking at it from a social justice perspective versus looking at it from a very economic standpoint. So the first couple of weeks we did focus on like what is economics and how can we influence it, and then we're looking at it. Um, as social justice now, and it's really interesting the topics. Were, in my last class, we talked about the uh, proposed HUD budget cuts and how that's going to affect people, and what we can do as social workers to kind of <coughs> help those vulnerable populations get what they need and the resources they need. Um, so that's a little bit about what I'm doing. Tony is a second year student, and he uh, is graduating, so he can tell you a little bit more about what advanced classes look like and the process of getting to graduation. So, Tony. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. As uh, Gerald said, I am well, I'm Tony Anite. I'm a second year student here at Pitt, and if I've paid off all the right individuals, I should be graduating in less than a month. <laughs> uh, just to start off, how many of y'all uh, are about to graduate from an undergrad? All right. Thank you. I've been in bed now, let's say, five years. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. <laughs> Ten. All right. Fifteen. Run. Twenty. Outstanding. Reason why I like to ask that because you know I know I make it look good, but I actually graduated uni about twenty years ago, almost twenty years ago. And why do I like to bring that up? It's because don't be scared to reach out and go for your dreams. It doesn't matter how long it may take you, this program is absolutely doable. It is tough, it is challenging, but it is doable. Uh, I started off my career after grad school as a, uh, I served many years as Marine Corps officer, a former major, <coughs> I spent three tours in Afghanistan. Um, as a vet, I have a background in international development after that, I had a background in government consultant. So this is actually my fourth career. And I'll tell you, it's most satisfying I've had yet. I finally, it took me a while, but I finally found what I should be doing the rest of my life. I'm a mental health concentration individual. I, uh, my goal is to work direct practice with uh, individuals with severe mental illness and with, those, and with veterans. Uh, my first internship here, I worked for what's called Mercy Behavioral Health. 
Um, and our mission there is basically we work with individuals who live with severe DSO-5 disorders that live out in the community. Basically, uh, when the state-run hospitals closed down, of course you had many individuals that were forced out of the community and unfortunately when that happened, uh, <coughs> communities at the time were not uh, prepared for the amount of people that were coming out in the sectors. Over the years, uh, we've built up many community-based programs to be able to help those individuals live within the community. Um, I, my first year last year, I worked with them for on a community treatment team that is composed of doctors, nurses, therapists, vocational specialists, and social work interns. And what we did, we actually provided therapy out in the community for those individuals, helped them with their ADLs, helped them out with those things such as simple as going out and letting them, helping them shop. And it was absolutely one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. This year, I had the great opportunity of interning at the Veterans Affairs Administration. I work on the mental health wards and uh, being able to take care of my brothers and sisters that have come back from the war and uh, needed help with the things that they're going through has been Again, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Now, we had talked about gerant uh, gerontology earlier. I'll be honest with you, I had no desire, never thought that I would be working with <coughs> a gerontology population. But I'll tell you what, I had no idea I was going to be working on a gerontology ward when I got there. So I'm like, oh, well, uh, I should have paid attention. But <laughs> so, you know, the reason why I say that is because within the realm of social work, you will work within a full spectrum of individuals, whether it be children or whether it be someone in their 90s. Um, so, even though you may not have a uh, you may have a specific, you know, concentration in mind, uh, just be mindful you will work with everybody. Um, as far as why I chose Pitt, uh, like many of you out there, I've applied to several programs across the nation. I, uh, after I either got my acceptance or denial, I decided to, you know, go out and visit these individuals, you know, these schools. I lived in 27 different places. I've never been to Pittsburgh in my life. The only thing I knew about Pittsburgh was steel mills and a football team called the Steelers. <laughs> so I was living in D.C. at the time, and I was like, you know what? I just got my acceptance letter. Let's go see what's up. So I came up to Pitt, and I requested a, uh, a uh, inter uh, meet and greet with uh, Mr. Mack. And I have to say, up to that point, I sat down with several individuals, other individuals, and they were nice. Come over here to Pitt, I sat down with Mr. Mack. He had some jumpsuit on, some hat. He's like, hey, so how you doing today? I'm like, oh wow. Where's the, so tell me about yourself. Why are you interested in Pitt? I was like, oh, this, this is social work. This is social work right here. I feel at ease, all right? <laughs> and, you know, after that, you know, I had the opportunity to sit down and actually talk to a student um, about the program and gave me a great tour of the building, gave me, you know, walked me over to financial aid. That's what I expected of an individual who is engrossed in social work. You know, here I am, you know, know nothing about the school, know nothing about, you know, the city. Gave me a great, felt comfortable, showed me around, advocated for me, introduced me to some of the, some of the faculty and staff. Uh, huge reason why I chose Pitt. I automatically saw it right then and there that, you know what, if this is the first representation I'm getting, I know the faculty is gonna take care of me. As a second year student, uh, what to expect, um, not to go into gross, uh, deep down on the dive, but you take four classes during your first and second semester during your first year. For your second year, you go down to three classes. That's because your field internship hours actually go up one more day. So you're going 24, you're going up 24 hours a week. Now that may not seem much, it takes a toll on 
Um, the great thing is this program can be finished within two years without having to go to summer school. Uh, at least for me, I'm crazy, so I took summer school. But uh, the great thing is, is I opened up by doing so my last semester here, right now, hopefully, thank God. Uh, I only have two classes. But I did that with the intention of, as, as Bobby was speaking about earlier, studying for that LSW exam. Great thing is, in School of Social Work, I can graduate next month as a licensed social worker. Now, what does that mean? You know, when you're negotiating for jobs, that means a lot. So, great thing also about Pitt, which you should consider as well, is four-year internships. You all know that you know sleep is uh, it's a valuable commodity in grad school. The great thing about Pitt is you cannot throw a stone outside this building and not hit a Pitt grad <laughs> social work. There are internships all over the city. What's, what does that mean? You're not having to drive 60 miles. One way to get to an internship is 60 miles back. I'm not going to say what other places you have to do that too, but you know it means a lot when you're, you're, your schedule is so hectic. You're trying to go to class. You're trying to go to you know the internship. You know there are multiple opportunities all over the city for internships. Why is that important? Because for my internship, where I just talked about <coughs> Mercy Behavioral Health, when it comes down to interviewing your second semester or your second year, all those contacts that you're beginning to make that first year can really come back and help you. Actually, I haven't told anyone this, but you know, I got a call from my old supervisor, my old internship two weeks ago. I said, hey, third position, therapist position's open. Put your application in now. And uh, lo and behold, just got an offer this week. So, it's, oh, we do it. Thank you, thank you very much. But that is how great the network here is at Pitt. You know, everywhere you go, there's always someone out there that's helping you on the way. Not only here at the faculty, but out in the community. Pitt grads look out for each other. Uh, if you have any other questions uh, or concerns, by all means, feel free to stop me. I'm also a graduate assistant for Mr. Mack. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about admissions or just out of curiosity, how many veterans do we have in here right now? I, uh, <coughs> sir? 24 years. Right. Army. Who up? I know my fellow sister here with the Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. If y'all definitely have questions, feel free to stop me. Thank you all very much. I, uh, I'm kind of sad because this is actually my last info session. I've been doing these for the past two years. And uh, I tell you what, it's always been a great thing to, when I get done with info sessions and it comes to August and I see all the new incoming candidates, it feels great. So I wish you all luck. You know, good luck with your careers, wherever that may be. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in August. Rob. Hi everyone, I'm Jesslyn Oliver. I'm the Admissions and Financial Aid Coordinator for the School of Social Work here. For anyone who might be interested in applying for the Fall 2018 term, the Priority Admissions deadline is relevant for you. That means that if you have your application in and complete with all the materials received in my office by December 31st with a 3.4 GPA or higher, and you are a first-time applicant to the program, then you are eligible for automatic admission and a scholarship. For those of you who are applying for the fall 2017 still, you have to pay attention to the April 30th deadline. That means that, yes, everything again will have to be received in my office and your whole application has to be complete and submitted by then. The components that make up your application are going to be very explicitly listed in Apply Yourself and explain to you what your personal statement needs to consist of. You'll need to submit a resume on there, an application fee, 
that can be submitted check or credit card online. Three recommendations. We are looking for no personal rec recommendations. We want one professional that could be your boss at a job and two academic. So an old professor or advisor and official transcripts from all of your colleges and universities that you have attended. A little more about your transcripts. This means that for those of you who might have been out of school for a while, you might have to, you might have forgotten that you took a three credit course or six credits at a community college. We're going to need all your transcripts official from every university. Um, this is a lot simpler now. A lot of universities do submit electronically. They can send official ones to my email. Or you can do snail mail, just have them send it to my office directly. We also require a statistics course as a prerequisite. For those of you who are applying for the fall term 2017 and maybe you don't have statistics, you would submit your, all of your transcripts right now and um, even if you're, you have classes that are in progress, we'll just see that and eventually you would need to submit official final ones that show a confer date and show a statistics course. So maybe you want to take one in the summer, that's fine. And we recommend just taking it at your local community college and any, pretty much anything with a statistics title in the course will count three credits at least over a hundred level and if you have any, any questions about whether or not it is, would count, you ask Philip or myself. So just some advice on the application process to keep it as least stressful for you. You want to make sure that you mark your calendars with that April 30th date. If you're a fall 2018 applicant, December 31st, that's very important. Make sure you set reminders to just stock your references, your recommenders, you know, keep on them, make sure that they're going to submit for you. And keep in mind that universities on both ends, the ones who are sending and receiving, everything goes through a mail room. So not, everything doesn't just get dumped in a mailbox and get sent quickly to us. There is a little bit of lag time between it going in the mail room, being processed, and then eventually coming to my office. So a couple weeks sometimes. You also want to make sure that you log in to apply yourself regularly to manage your application. You can see updates in there. Of, whether, of what I've received thus far, whether your um, people have submitted on your behalf yet for your references. And here's just an image of what Apply Yourself looks like. Right there I have circled check your application. It's very user friendly. Um, I went in there and made myself a faux application. So here, once you check the actual status, you'll be able to see your references and whether or not they've submitted or not you'll be able to see there if transcripts have been received and just a note you are going to be told whether or not your references have submitted electronically via email they'll also get a notification thanking them for the submission so it's very easy and apply yourself to check note about financial aid so everybody here probably has dealt with financial aid FAFSA forms in their undergrad but just a note that I think is important to mention that for what we remember in undergrad is subsidized loans, no interest being accrued while you are in school. But for graduate school, the only ones that they offer you are unsubsidized, which means that they do accrue interest. So you want to be responsible when you're receiving loans and perhaps pay your interest while you're in school and then budget for yourself and decide, okay, how much do I actually need? And you can always return what you do not want. They disperse to you twenty thousand dollars or twenty thousand five hundred, and you say, "I actually don't need six thousand. Give it back. Try to be responsible for yourselves and manage that well." And note that um, whenever you apply for FAFSA, those loans will be dispersed in the summer. And you can always follow up with OFA, the Office of Admission and Financial Aid. There, they are who handles your FAFSA forms directly you'll want to inquire with them. And then I've also just listed some other helpful websites, our website and the General University of Pittsburgh website. In addition, we have a Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter. I think that our Facebook page will be rather helpful for those of you who are going to be joining us. This can help you meet new people online. This can help you, people are posting about 
needing roommates perhaps in the fall. So this is a great way to <coughs> network with people prior to arriving and get used to the environment and everybody who's gonna be in the program with you. Meet new friends, meet roommates, whatever it might be. And hear about what's going on in, in the department. So I recommend you follow on all those social media form formats and check on everything with OFA.